Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is episode number 100. I can't believe it. We're here. A hundred. I mean, there are millions of podcasts out there, and the average podcast dies by episode 17. And yet, in less than two years, so September will be two years since the first episode was published, in less than two years, we've done a hundred episodes. And there is so much more to come. There are three more episodes after this one, which are audio-based only. After that, we're switching to video-based episodes. There's going to be video interviews and short videos of me talking directly to you, the audience, about things related to entrepreneurship that you wish you knew about, that I've lived through, and that my guests have lived through. So the knowledge and experience we all have is coming together into this one great YouTube channel where you can learn a lot about different ways to get unstuck based on where you are with your company right now. We're also going to have a Discord server where you can chat with other entrepreneurs and there's so much to come. I'm really excited. I'm happy you've joined me for this entire journey so far and I know that there's so much more coming that we'll be able to help you to improve your business and your life and let you have what it is you want, which is hopefully a solid business, a great team, a lot of money, and some free time to live the way you want to live. So let's talk about this episode. Our guest today is Omri Shafran, an Israeli serial entrepreneur based in the U.S. who is currently the CEO of Texas Medical Technology a company that produces personal protective equipment as well as physical machines that dispense the equipment safely. He's also the CEO of iNitral, the CEO of SureSpot, and owns and manages many different real estate properties. He's also gone to Harvard Business School. In this episode, we talk about how he got into doing PPE, originally turning a $1,000 investment into over $150 million in revenue in two years. What made him want to move into creating the machines that dispense the equipment because that's not something a lot of people would have thought to do and it's really cool. And where is healthcare going next? And I can tell you his vision of it is freaking cool. So I hope you enjoy this episode with Omri. I know I did. Let's get to it. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Henri Chafron. Why don't you tell everyone what it is you do right now and a brief backstory of how you got to this point in your entrepreneurial career, and we'll go from there. My name is Henri Chafron, and I'm the CEO of Texas Medical Technology. I will give you a brief uh, overview about a little bit about my uh, entrepreneurship uh, experience. I started being an entrepreneur, I think, since, since I remember myself from a very early age. Uh, the first company I opened when I was 14, it's a computer company that uh, just uh, trained people on computers. And later on, I joined the Israeli Navy SEAL. I uh, served there for four years, and then I uh, pretty much uh, formed my uh, next company, which was uh, Coffee uh, Roasting and uh, Distribution. And we have our own brand in the uh, late 1990s really before 2000. Sold the company. I uh, started uh, pretty much uh, renovating uh, condos and then start buying apartments. Uh, so at one point of time, my group uh, reached to ownership and management of 2,200 units. 
in the Houston area and the construction uh, grew as well. We built airports in Texas, so we built about 13 airports, broadwalk parks, apartments, senior livings, and this was a very, very uh, interesting journey. Uh, but my passion always was uh, through technology innovation. I decided to sell everything I had pretty much in uh, 2013, and I invested uh, almost all in into the technology. Since I was the worst Israeli Navy SEAL navigator, I think in the Israeli history, uh, I have no orientation, no sense of orientation. And I went to Paul McCartney show in 2012 and uh, I couldn't find my parking spot as well as uh, my car when I came back from the concert. So I decided to develop a solution for that, uh, which called SureSpot. Um, it's a full solution for um, finding your car, park your car, reserve parking in advance, find your spot. I did it for the last seven years. We have a parking uh, locations from the New York Yankees on the east to Pasadena on the west, where we provide 360 solution for parking. 2019, uh, my friend, it was December, called December, even in Houston, Texas. Uh, my friend, Dimitri, he called me and see, look what's going on in China. I start uh, going to the John Hopkins website and see the red circles growing bigger and bigger uh, and we say why don't we start a trading mask so um january we struggle we went on whatsapp group we start building our network uh, from friends from harvard business school through friends from all over the world and we couldn't close any deal we didn't give up and the first deal we strike was uh, february 2020 uh, my direct navy seal commander he purchased from me mask k95 face mask in fifty-eight thousand dollars. we formed the company on uh, march 25th so it's almost two years 2020 uh, on april we sold about four million dollar on uh, may we sold about six million dollar uh the major deal with it was eleven and a half million dollar for the va it was uh, july 2020 and then was a jewish guy that used to call me and ask me hey can you give me some gowns i said it one time two times three times i said man I'm not sending you anymore. It cost me $300 every time to overnight to you, the samples to New York. Uh, no, 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 last time, last time. So I sent him last time. Apparently it was for a very large government entity, one of the largest, and it was for a $1.2 billion bid. We get a call on uh, November 5th, 2020. Um, are you Texas Medical? Yes, we are. Okay, we come to inspect your factory. Back then we have no factory. All we have is 5,000 square foot of office. Uh, we had four days to organize and arrange everything. We rent a, a big tent. Uh, we post on Facebook, uh, hiring advertising for production with hundreds of people come to apply for work. Imagine two government auditor arriving to the 5,000 square foot office. What is this? You know, you ask, it's a 1.2 billion. We need to have uh, employees for this uh, kind of size of uh, deal. They ate lunch. They say, okay, it's a very nice office. Where is the factory? So uh, we took them to one Vietnamese friend of us on the north side of town. And uh, we put them, we tell them, okay, listen, give us another another shot. We knew a friend of us that own an old Sam's club on the south side of town. Uh, we call him Sean. 20 minutes, we're arriving, please open us the doors. So we open us the door. So imagine a sales club with a sushi, salad bar, pharmacy, nothing else, only floor. And imagine two government auditor arriving to an empty sales club. And I'm telling him the dream that we're going to build a factory that will produce surgical gowns for the US government when you still have the sushi and the pharmacy and the shrimp and the meat stickers on the refrigerators and on and so just imagine this picture. They were in shock. Sir, it's a $1.2 billion bid. Sorry, uh, we can't do it here. I apologize. Thank you for your time and for your service. They left. We succeeded to convince the SPA that we're going to build your factory. They got an order for $50 million, which convert later on to 380 because they saw that we did what we promised. We signed on the list on November 19th, and in 90 days, we build a factory. Uh, we put everything we had into this factory. Uh, back later on, uh, obviously the company evolved. And I think the major change that we did, that we always try to forecast the future. I think the pandemic teach us that the ocean has a lot of waves 
a lot of winds and you need to navigate your ship very smart, very fast in order to reach to the safe shore. And in this pandemic, especially in our business, it changed in a matter of hours. So the mask that we sold at 325 were worthless three months after. Then become the gown, surgical gown, which been sold for $9 a gown, and then it become like worthless. So you have to navigate a company really fast, really aggressive, and to have a very uh, long vision in order to survive and to succeed. So July 2020, we also start investing in technology. In the Navy SEAL, I was uh, on the rescue team. So there's team three, team six, and I was rescue team. When my goal is to bring the boys home when operation goes south. So we go to medical school, we do all the kind of training. And I think right now I have the ability to accomplish. My purpose in life is to save and change and make a better healthcare and save people lives. I did it back then 25 years ago with my own hands. And now I try to do it with my brain. And what we invest, start investing in July 2020, before we knew the pandemic would be over, uh, before we knew there would be a vaccine, is in medical technology. What we did, we pretty much created a foundation for MetaHealth. So we start investing in a a lot of products, uh, devices that distribute the personal protective equipment in much smarter, efficient, and better way. Shoe cover dispenser, vending machine for uh, for surgical gowns, and we developed from scratch with eighteen uh, engineers that we hire from GE, from Tesla, from Audi. We develop an automated uh, gown dispenser. So uh, we we invested a lot to create vision for our hospital to have all this distribution that today are being stored in some storage to be automated. So imagine that Stephanie go to the hospital put her RFID and insert her end. The glove has been dispensed on her end. Imagine that David, the doctor, want to go to the operation room. All he has to do is to swipe his card, he get his surgical kit, he put his two feet and get uh, the shoe cover dispenser and he get his gown and he get his, everything is very efficient. We took it to the next level of meta health and what we did, we created 360 virtual tour in an hospital where it's a one-stop shop platform for the maintenance, for the procurement, for the nurse, for the MD, for the surgeon. So imagine the maintenance guy can touch the light and can see what is the status of light of every single floor. Imagine he can touch the AC and can see the temperature in every single floor. The procurement manager can touch the automated glove dispenser and see how many gloves in each uh, dispenser. He can see the status of his inventory for uh, syringes. He can see the status of gowns. Imagine the doctor enter virtually into the patient room or the operation room and can see 3D, the body of the patient, and can touch his art and can see the art, the AKG, blood pressure. He can take off the skin virtually and see connected to the x-ray and see the, see the status of the ribs, the bone, the backbone. We're investing in a lot of uh, emerging technology. Uh, I'll give you two examples. We just purchased 4.76% in Israeli company named Olive, where they invented a toilet seat that can recognize all the urine disease and through a lithoscope. Also, we invested in 5% in a company named Omnisense, where they recognize all the vital through the thermometer. So they can see through a thermometer your uh, oxygen, blood pressure, AKG, and so on and on. All of these items will be connected to the meta health. So imagine that Sean, right now, going to the doctor, and um, I'm connecting already to his 23andMe. Uh, I know that Sean is allergic to lactose. I'm connected to uh, his Apple Watch, how many times he went to, the, to work out, how, how, how many miles he worked uh, on the treadmill. I connected to Sean Metros, the thermopedic, and I know that Sean slept only four hours every night in the last week. Then I'm the nurse. I'm sending Sean to take a, a, a urine uh, exam. So he go to the toilet, he just pee, he doesn't need to put it in the canister. The olive diagnostic toilet seat recognize already all the urine uh, data. Sean coming back to the room, me as a doctor, I have all the vitals, way more than I had before, and I can provide Sean a much better treatment 
and a much better solution. So this is MetaHealth, and that's what we're focusing all day long. I haven't heard of many companies that are trying to go in as many directions, but I can see when you pull out a little bit further and you look at the larger picture of what healthcare looks like now, what's possible in the next few years and where it it looks like we're headed over the next 10, 20, 30 years, why it makes sense to kind of get your hands into as many pies as possible, because if you can do that, then you can create this kind of uh, full picture of, of an individual. And I think companies like Apple and Google are the best positioned to do so, but that doesn't mean that there's no room for other companies like yours to kind of step up and work uh, with other companies to to put together the hardware that connects the software so that you can get a complete picture of all the, the people. I wonder, do you think people are ready for this, to have all of this data and have it be coordinated and automated and communicating with human doctors from afar and connected through AI and Bluetooth and all of this? First of all, it's a transition. And because of the big boys like Google and Apple, everybody agreed to wear the Apple Watch. Everybody agreed to sign a consent for his thermopedic. I have thermopedic home. Everybody joined the 23andMe. Millions of millions of people, if not tens of millions of people, even in the U.S., signed a consent to participate in the research. And I can tell you the first hospital we approached with this idea, not that just allow us to do, uh, it's called the Woodland Specialty Hospital, not that just, just allow us to do the first case study of metal in their hospital. They beg us to be part of the equity in metal. So they pretty much, the, the main doctor and the owner, uh, Dr. Ravi, he actually was so excited about it because it will solve so many problems that you cannot even imagine. When I look at hospitals today, I see very specific problems, and that's based on my experience as an advocate for uh, my father who, who has had heart problems in the past. The problems that I saw specifically that I don't know specifically how to handle is one, communication between the primary care doctor and the doctor at the hospital and all of the specialists and the nurses and the nurse practitioners that are taking care of the patient, a real understanding of the medications they need and when they need them and how they need them, actually administering those things properly, making sure that they're not missed or they're not late or they're not doubled up on because the staff is overwhelmed and overworked and exhausted. There's so many problems that I experienced where I had to learn in a very short period of time. I mean, I had 24 hours to learn how to read the heart monitors and the blood pressure monitors and trying to understand what is normal, what is abnormal for all of these different numbers. You know, what what should a saturated oxygen be? You know, at what point should I get worried and call the doctor? Is the doctor that's treating my dad the right person? So I think there's a lot of problems from the patient advocate side that are probably not being addressed because the hospital might be looking at it from how can we have more data? Now, the ability to collect the data and understand the data and use the data is obviously important, but I feel like if there's not anything on the other side, meaning helping the advocate for the patient, then it's leaving this massive hole in in the evolution of healthcare. I'll give you two examples of that that we're doing uh, right now with the uh, Woodland uh, Hospital. Imagine that the, the way it works today, let's say there's operation. The doctor said, the nurse sitting on a chair, uh, imagine the surgeon has the, all his tools, and he said, okay, I see Sean right now. Oh, he has some uh, tumor, and I apologize. Let's just uh, take you as an example. He has a tumor at a one inch on the one o'clock, and the nurse doing other stuff, and she goes, oh, he has a three inch or the three o'clock right? Because she's confused for some, some reason. We connected the MetaHealth because we're working with the Olo, Microsoft Olo, virtual reality. So the system trace on real time, where is the tumor? On real time, what is the size? The system already alerting you that Sean might have AKG problem. We're working on prevention uh, program in order to give Sean a much better health. 
much better treatment in the future. So, I mean, I, I don't want to bog down our conversation in, in my point of view of focusing on the patient advocate. I just wanted to throw it out there because maybe it's something you want to think about, or maybe there's someone listening who wants to think about it and pursue it. And, and if I don't see anything being done in the next few years, maybe I'll throw my hat in the ring and I'll focus on something like that. Because even last year, I'm sure you saw patients who were going in for surgery to amputate the right leg, but then the left leg was amputated because of some mess up in the notes. You know, things that shouldn't be happening are happening. And there are, you know, you can't recover from that. You can't undo those kinds of damages. So while I'm in favor of using technology, I think technology should be used to minimize risk first. Correct. So that the patient doesn't walk out with the wrong leg removed or the patient doesn't die because they gave them too much of a pain medication because they miscalculated the the height to weight ratio because the patient lied about their weight or whatever, or, or they lied about their drug use. Maybe they were, they had a higher tolerance or, or a lower tolerance or whatever. So I, I think that when looking at how to improve healthcare and developing a meta health system, I, I believe artificial intelligence will be a really important tool for managing the data and making decisions and removing humans from the loop in some way so that the chances of mistakes being made are you know removed. Just like how people are talking about self-driving cars, we know that Cars can drive better than humans in some ways, but there's still these kind of existential questions about, well, can we trust them, you know, to to not crash and kill a bunch of people? So yeah. I think healthcare is on its way in that regard, but probably a bit further behind. So do you have any ideas for how medicine and healthcare and tech in general can think about those things? And or do you know of anything that's being done now? Meta health, what we do, we put a patient risk the highest priority as possible. Uh, we see ourselves uh, to help the patient uh, before everybody else. So before the doctor, before the hospital, before making money, the patient is the most important. Actually, to protect his privacy as well as really to give him the right treatment. And as you mentioned before, not to cut him the wrong leg or not to cut him the wrong uh, side of, of the kidney. We're doing all the cautious, all the actions that needed in, uh, in order to reach to this point uh, where we can uh, actually make an amazing system uh, that really, really solve this uh, major problem that you just mentioned. What do you think about the use of blockchain in establishing unique identities for patients so that they can have a history of all of their medical procedures, doctor's visits, medications, things that have changed, you know, just like a ledger of their medical history. So that instead of having to, every time they go to a new doctor or a new hospital or whatever, you know, right now you have to call the main, you know, your primary care doctor, and then they have to fax it to the hospital with all of the details. It's just very slow and you know, you, you have HIPAA laws, so you have to sign another paper saying that you can share this information with this person or that person. What do you think of this kind of, uh, this blockchain-based system? I love it. And uh, this is actually phase three in metals. As you know, the, the, the war is going through uh, telemedicine. And uh, part of the telemedicine is uh, obviously that whenever Sean's sitting in his home, he can communicate with his doctor, a new doctor, and can... Uh, set him like with a millisecond all his uh, medical data and and when he go to hospital he just touch with his apple watch and all the all his medical data uh is being transferred on a blockchain on a blockchain technology into the, the hospital and of course all, all the security uh and privacy a procedure being implemented. And in, in a further future, maybe the medical records will exist as an implanted chip in your hand and using NFC technology and you just wave your hand or RFID and you just wave your hand over the, some machine and you can automatically check into the hospital. And then when it's time to pay the bills, you can wave your hand again and it'll automatically pay the bill. <laughs> Great idea. Some people are thinking about that, uh, particularly being able to make payments with this kind of implanted chip 
I think embedding your medical history into the same chip along with your payment system would be uh, easy and, and a, t a space saver because I don't know about you, but personally, I don't like the idea of things being implanted in me, but I think there's other people that are okay with it. Yeah, I'm sure there are. You talked about the technology you've been developing, these um, dispensers for gowns, shoes, uh, you know, shoe sleeves, uh, as well as gloves. What gave you the idea for that? And where is it now in terms of its development? The main thing that we developed from scratch was the automated glove dispenser. Pretty much we got a call from an hospital that uh, asked us if we have a solution for sterilized gloves, as well as uh, there is a major problem. Uh, so think about Google Nest. The way that uh, Google enter your home slash Amazon, they provide you the Nest or they provide you the, the camera or they provide you the Alexa. And through this, they create your smart home, right? They care about the data. They don't care about the Alexa. Actually, they're losing money on the Alexa. They're losing money on the Nest. They care about the data because that's what's important. Because after you have the lock and after you have the camera and after you have the Alexa, and then you have the light bulb and so on and the thermostat. So all your home becomes a smart home. And they're gathering the data, which is the gold of the 21st century. So we want to penetrate into the hospital in one of their, the points that I think they suffer the most. Uh, the second uh, most cons consumable uh, item in a surgery room is gloves. If we can save the hospital 40% on the glove, if we can create traceability for the glove, so you can see the history of each glove, and if you have a broken glove, which happened from time to time, and a doctor uh, been content with HIV or, or any other disease, you can trace it back and see what's going on, and where it's coming from, as well as a, deliver a sterile glove. I think once you have all these three key points, hospital are so excited to get this device. The way we make money is the same as HP or Nespresso giving you the coffee machine for a cost and just make money on the coffee or HP giving you the printer even in a loss and just making money on the ink. And for the meta health, it gives us the penetration to implement the meta health in the same hospital because the platform that the glove dispenser is working on, that's meta health. So the procurement manager, when he wants to control all his high nitro automated glove dispenser to the hospital, he look into it through meta health. Pretty much, I think the glove is something that hospital really have a problem to control, especially after the pandemic. They don't go anywhere. Actually, the consumption has been four or five times more. Everything came from a need that from hospital for sterilized uh, gloves and uh, to, to control the, the waste. I think it's a good model. I know my parents have a Hewlett Packard printer and I remember a long time ago, you would be able to just buy the ink on your own from Office Depot, Office Max, one of these companies. And now HP will just mail it to you like on auto repeat. So you pay them a certain amount per month and they make sure that you're always topped up with ink. And they even now start like charging you based on the number of pages you print per month. And you can like pay for a package and, and uh, the, the amount of ink that they give you is based on the number of pages you say you want to print. It's crazy, but my parents paid, let's say $300 for this printer, but they're paying like $80 a month for paper or ink. It's insane. Absolutely insane, the uh, the way that these companies have figured out how to create their own walled gardens. But if you're able to do that, I mean, it makes more sense because you're trying to make those gloves and sell those gloves. So if you also have the machine that dispenses those gloves, it makes sense that you lock them into buying your gloves. But, but again, I don't care about the gloves. I care about the data because the data, it starts from gloves. Right, but... If you could sell them the gloves, you're going to try. Of course, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, it makes, you know, it, it's just an extra revenue stream. So what do you actually do with that data? Imagine that I have a data uh, both for the hospital and for the patient. If I know the consumption of hospital, I can be connected to their ERP system and provide them a much better forecast for 2023 and 2024 for their consumption of gloves. So they can make a much better procurement and they can save money as well as... Uh, they can put more money in the patient and uh, in diagnostic and treatment equipment and uh, buying gloves sometimes that they don't need to. And it's a glove and it's gowns and it's shoe cover, head cover. It's, 
all these items. We connected to all these items also for the prevention. So imagine that you have, I take it to the extreme, you have two rooms, uh, one with uh, sick people, one with healthy people in the same hospital. And you find out that the people that sick, both of them, all of them eat chicken soup and the people that healthy eat chicken soup. However, the air quality in the room is not good enough as well as the nurse didn't put glove when she treated them as well as the temperature was. So we take all these surrounding data and we implement it into the vitals for the patient, people that hospitalized for a month, two months in the hospital. So it's important. Let's uh, give you one, one example of a key factor that we were checking out. For that to work, you would have to have your own machines that monitor their vital signs to be able to connect into that data because I don't think the machines that exist today do that. Or if they do, they're in their own walled garden, am I right? Correct. So 23andMe as API, uh, we are working right now with Israeli company that do purifier, air purifier, it's called Aura, smart purifier. So they have already tens of thousands of units uh, nationwide. We connected to them. We connect into Apple Watch. Um, we are working now with Honeywell to connect it to their uh, temperature system. Uh, we're connecting to their uh, RFID for the elevators. Um, so you're right, it's uh, hundreds of uh, data points uh, and it's a very challenging to company that is not Apple or Google to, to do so, but um, we keep doing it. And we're pushing to connect more and more and more companies uh, into our system uh, until the big boys will uh, start joining us as G, Philips and uh, MRI, CT, X-ray uh, will join us. So for example, because we know that x-ray, it's very challenging, right? Because G won't jump and say, ah, oh, okay, this is a meta, it's a nice, cool, let's, let's integrate to you. So we're going through, uh, there is this Israeli company that do AI for x-ray. So it's much easier for us to integrate with Zebra, they do AI for x-ray, than to integrate actually with G or Philips. Right. Of course, it's easier to connect with startups that have their APIs open and ready. Now, I know you're based in America, and from our conversations, it seems like you're proud to be in America and, and to be given the opportunities to do these kinds of things in the U.S. One of the countries that I'm very familiar with that would probably love what you're doing is China. Have you thought about trying to do something like this with a Chinese joint venture? Because trying to do it on your own, you'll fail. Uh, there's no way you'll be able to do it as a wholly foreign enterprise. But I think with a JV, you might be able to do that. My age, I'm, I will I will be turned 46 on May. And I feel like I lived like 900 years old man. In this age, I understand what I'm not good at and what I'm good at. I think it's more important to understand what you're not good at. And I think, I think into together... Being in 12,000 hospital, I'm not good at. And I think having a joint venture like with Honeywell, that we take their platform of having their thermostats, their lighting, their AC on 12,480 hospitals uh, will be much better than the direction that we're going through. Either Honeywell or Medline or Cardinal, this is kind of the joint venture that we want to do. I, I think American company are much more open to this uh, and and obviously they will give a huge preference to American company. But again, I'm not against any Chinese or any, any other joint venture. I think it's wise to keep your options open. And I can definitely see having spent the last 10 months in America that American companies are... And I think a lot of countries are doing this now. It might be because of the pandemic. It might be because of uh, what's going on in Ukraine. It could be multiple factors. But I feel like countries are focusing more locally now than before, where we spent the last few decades globalizing. I feel like globalization is receding in a way. And it's not that it's a bad thing, because I, I do believe that the U.S. had a lot to offer the world. And as it became wealthier, it kind of shed the most important parts of its economy and uh, exported it to other countries. So I, even though Biden is quite a an old uh, man in the way he thinks about the world and he harkens back to uh, an old school world where, you know, America was this 
powerhouse uh, manufacturer. I do believe that bringing manufacturing back to America in a high-tech sense uh, could be a really interesting thing. So I, I don't think you're wrong in looking at, uh, you know, having a company in America, hiring Americans. It might be more expensive, but you can serve the American economy quite well, I think. How have you found uh, the experience so far with building in America, building a manufacturing, you know, hiring? I believe you hire veterans and, and people who are disabled, uh, if I'm not wrong. So uh, how have you found uh, your experience in general? Because, you you know, you're, you are a foreigner, right? You may have spent a long time in America, but you're not from America. So uh, you may be perceived differently from others, but America is meant to be this country of immigrants. Um, so how do you feel as, as an Israeli in America, building an American company, hiring Americans, trying to serve the American society? Most of our employees are uh, Afghan refugees, refugees, uh, disabled veteran, veteran, second chance uh, we are very, very open. Uh, me and Dimitri are third generation Holocaust survivor. So for us, it's very important to have welcome all these refugees. And, and we know a little bit about what happened in their country. But uh, as living in Israel for almost 30 years, I can tell you that I've seen it, I've done it. And, and it's sometimes it's very challenging. We have a very sweet spot for these people. I think, I, I, I won't say USA because USA is a very large country the continent. But if I say Texas, I love it. I just love it. It's amazing. The people here, uh, the government, the way they welcome business. It's so easy to do business here. Uh, all the agencies, everybody really has the attitude that you will succeed. Uh, unlike other countries, it's the best country in the world, no doubt. And Texas, uh, again, I apologize from the other state, but this is the, I think, one of the most uh, favored states, uh, states ever. So uh, it's very easy to do uh, business and, uh, and to, to support everybody and everything's so efficient. So I think because of the pandemic and because of how expensive uh, California has become, a lot of startups have moved from that area to Houston, Dallas, Austin area. And I've been to Austin myself about, uh, I think it was 2017. I was there for about a week and I thought it was a beautiful place. I went in the, uh, in the fall time, closer to winter. And I, I thought it was a very beautiful city and had a great experience. So I can only imagine what it would be like to live there long term. Um, and I do know quite a few people who would love to live in Texas. So if you're looking for a place to uh, settle in and start a company, Texas could be a good place. I, I'm just talking to the audience here. I think it could be a good place for, for people. And I had actually thought multiple or several years ago that if I had ever come to actually live in America again, I would probably consider Austin uh, as the first place I'd want to live. And this was before I think a lot of the startups started moving there. So is there anything that we didn't touch upon that you'd like to mention? No, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, definitely a very smart uh, interview. You asked a very smart question and you have a great ideas as well. I think it's one of the first interviews in my life that I've been educated and, uh, and get, uh, get uh, new ideas and uh, it's really refreshing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Is there any way that people can follow up with you? Sure. Uh, everybody can uh, em feel free to email me. I, uh, we have a website, uh, texasmedicaltechnology.com, uh, omri.chafran at texasmedicaltechnology.com. Uh, you can Google me and Google the company, and I always answer 24-7. So, yeah, thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I really appreciate it, and hopefully what we've talked about gives people ideas for their own businesses, how to think bigger, definitely starting a company with $1,000 and growing it to over $140 million in revenue in two years is phenomenal. Most people would be like beside themselves with joy just to you know have a business get to 100000 in the first year. So congratulations on all your success, and I, I'd love to see what you're up to as time goes on. Uh, so don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. Thank you, Omri. Thank you so much.